What's up? My name is Techno, here for Troubleshoot, and welcome back to another video. In this quick video, I'll be taking you through a much, much deeper dive into creating images on your PC using Stable Diffusion and Image Creation Neural Network. It's a really cool thing, and it's building upon yesterday's video, which was sort of a dipping the toe into the pool of image generation. This one is a similar project. It's also a web-based UI. However, it goes a lot, a lot deeper. That being said, by the end of this video, you may be a mega nerd or you may be completely out of your depth. Be prepared for a lot very quickly. Once again, yesterday's video, you'll find it linked down below, is a lot simpler and a much easier place to get started. I would absolutely recommend using the WSL on Windows 11 or Windows 10 running Ubuntu in order to get this all set up. Yes, there are some installation tips for running this under Windows, but once again, I'd recommend just using WSL or Linux if you're already on Linux. In the description down below, you'll find a link to the Stable Diffusion web UI page here, which is the project that we'll be using. This is one of probably hundreds at this point, but it seems to be the most in-depth and most controllable. It gives you a ton of options, including text to image, image to image extras, which include includes upscaling and many things like that. It gives us a ton of control without having to use specifically just the command line. It's a really, really good, really in-depth UI that's easy to get lost in, but it gives you a ton of control. You'll need an NVIDIA graphics card or an AMD GPU and probably at least four gigabytes of VRAM. There's some options that you can add to try and lower the amount of VRAM, but that's pretty much the bare minimum. On this main page, you'll find automatic installation with Windows, which we won't be doing here. You'll need Python 3.10. Add Python to path when you're installing it on that first screen, install git, download and run this, place the model checkpoint into models, place gfpcan next to the webui.python file and simply run it. We can also use the automatic installer. However, they don't talk about WSL here. They do that on the other page in the wiki. You can check the wiki here or by scrolling to the top and clicking wiki here. On the wiki, we get features, dependencies, installation, etc. We're looking for installation to run on NVIDIA GPUs here. Then scrolling down on this page, Windows, Linux, a manual installation, scrolling down even further, Windows 11 WSL 2 instructions. That's what we'll be following here, and this should work for Windows 10 as well, using the WSL. Regardless, basically just copy all these commands here, and we'll open up an Ubuntu terminal. So I'll fire up Ubuntu, and just like that, under the WSL, in my home directory, you can see I have some projects from yesterday's video still lying around. I'll copy and paste in all of these commands from here, simple as that. It'll run through and do everything for us, all automated. Of course, it's probably better to run these one at a time, but whatever, YOLO, I'm running them all anyways. Reading through Anaconda here by holding enter, I'll answer yes, leave everything as default. Do you wish to initialize? Yes. Now it's already cloned the project. It's downloading GFPGAN, which is the last optional step. Let's have a look at the files, then ls the models folder. And inside of here, we're supposed to place stable diffusion checkpoints. So to do so, we'll head back to the GitHub page, back to the wiki, dependencies, and you can see over here, the stable diffusion model checkpoint is required, .ckpt. We can download this from the official Hugging Face website, for which we'll need an account and to share our contact information, there's a file storage download and a torrent here. Whatever method you decide to use, you'll end up with a four gigabyte file like this. This is 1.4, in the future, it'll be 1.5. See me though I'm on Windows, I can simply move this file from this folder into my project over here by running explorer.exe space dot. It'll open a file browser here where I can open up the models folder and simply drag and drop my checkpoint into here. I'm cutting and pasting just so I don't have duplicate files on my PC. Then going back and into the ESR GAN folder. These are where the upscalers will go. Things can get really in depth here. You can download a ton of different ESR GAN models for upscaling by going to the model database here. You just need a .pth extension and they should not be real ESR GAN models as they're not ESR GAN models. They're different things. This is a wiki page here that talks about different models. And at the very top, number one, ESR GAN old architecture models is what we're looking for. We've got universal, realistic, art pixel drawings, etc. Tons of different options here. And we have model collections as number two. If we open, say, universal models, for example, there's different models here. We can download them by clicking the link on the left hand side, read about them and the purpose and a shortened purpose here, check out samples, etc. I've chosen to download a few of these and a 
essentially will just end up with a ton of PTH files. You can of course skip downloading your own and go straight to the model collections over here and download some of these or maybe just one or two of them and read about what they do here. They all have different purposes so it'll be very confusing but when you have a couple of these you can pick between them in the web UI so it's really not that important. I've got a ton of these in a folder so I'll simply cut all of these and drop them into my ESRGAN folder here. Some of these that aren't compatible with ESRGAN, you'll be told about them when you try and run the project. So using ls, we can see webui.sh. This is the file we want to run, dot slash webui.sh. I'll hit enter. It'll activate everything on our PC, install Torch and TorchVision, if not already installed, under Python 3.10.6. This is around a two or so gigabyte download, so you'll need to sit around for a short minute or two. Speaking of downloads, while this is happening, now is the best point to read about what this project actually does. On this page here, checking the wiki of the project once more, on the homepage, we'll find a features section. This is where we can read about what the project actually does. We've got outpainting, which expands on existing images, inpainting, which takes objects out and tries to replace them based on what we feed it, masking for inpainting. Then we have prompt matrix. Essentially, we can run multiple things like this, such as a prompt, a busy city street in a modern city, and we can use the tags illustration and cinematic lighting. It'll then generate something that looks exactly like this with four different modes, so we can pick what we want here. Here's five prompts and 16 variations, for example. Then we have stable diffusion upscaling. Down here, we have some examples, such as the original image, real ESR GAN, Topaz Gigapixel, and the stable diffusion upscaler, which is one of the tools included in this model. In this project, we can use both real ESR GAN and SD upscale, at least I'm pretty sure. To use this feature, we'll tick a checkbox in the image to image interface. The image will be upscaled to twice the original width and height, etc. And here's some recommended parameters for upscaling. Then we have attention, which is really really useful. We can use normal brackets to increase a certain keyword's attention, making it more important, or square brackets to decrease it. Then we have loopback, which runs the same image through the AI multiple times to make different iterations on it. XY plots, once again, as different examples of different settings in this case, for which we can create using this simple step over here by setting all of these settings for us to review. Textual inversion, which allows us to use pre-trained textual inversion embeddings. We can download many pre-trained embeddings from this page here. Essentially, this allows us to add specific things to our model. For example, sitting in an S pose, we can bring this onto other images that aren't related, bring this little cat into images, etc. And we can even train our own to import, say, ourselves into this. At least I'm pretty sure I'll be diving into that in another video. For example, learning an art style like this and applying it to different images, etc. Really cool. Checking the library over here, you can see there's a couple of different things. You can download them separately. There's 576 of these here. For example, the Bonzi Buddy <laughs> allows us to add Bonzi into whatever images we'd like. Unlike your PC, you'd want to keep this little demon as far away from you and your files as possible. Anyways, once again, if you want me to come back to this, make sure to let me know. I'll come back to it in another video. Video. Resizing, different sampling methods, Euler A, Euler, LMS, Hewn, DPM2, DPM2A, DDIM, and PLMS. Seed resizing, variations, styles, and negative prompt, which is really important as well. Essentially, we can tell it certain keywords to avoid, and by telling it keywords, it's going to avoid them as best as it can. For example, tentacles, there's no tentacles anywhere inside here because it's trying to avoid anything that's tentacle like. Avoiding purple, for example, all of these are red, while the rest of these are all purple. The clip interrogator allows us to retrieve prompts from an image. The prompt won't allow us to reproduce the exact image. Sometimes it won't even be close, but it's a good start. So we can throw an image into here and learn about what it looks like. There's tons of different options here. Prompt editing, for example, high res fix, which is a convenience option to partially render our image at a lower resolution, then upscale it and add details at a high resolution. And by default, text to image makes horrible images at very high resolutions. This makes it possible to avoid that using small pictures, compositions, and enable the high res fix checkbox on the text to image page. Pretty cool. There's an interrupt button to stop processing and four gigabyte video card support. We can run low VRAM and medium VRAM when we run the actual project itself. Face restoration, pretty cool. We'll be using GFP GAN, which is included in this. I think code former as well. Saving using a save button, etc, etc. There's tons of options here. Anyways, after all of that long explanation, let's get back to it. It's probably all set up, hopefully. Having a look here, there's tons of different models that have failed to load, but that's fine. I don't think these are actual real ESR GAN models, or maybe I'm just missing files. Anyways, you can see down at the bottom here, running 
on a local URL, I can control click this to open in our browser. And just like that, we can start generating. Let's go with Spaceman, generate, and let's see what happens. More than likely, nothing. Sorry to disappoint. Check your console and see if there's an error. If you see something about CUDNN, count open shared object or file, it doesn't exist. We need to make sure that CUDNN is in our library path. I'll simply run sudo find slash user slash hyphen name libcuda.so. This is the file that we're looking for, and we should find two of them, assuming you have NVIDIA CUDA installed. If not, in the description down below, you'll find a guide for setting up and installing NVIDIA CUDA drivers on the WSL. Essentially, this is the official Ubuntu page talking about how to set it up on WSL. You just need to make sure you have the latest version of the NVIDIA drivers installed on your host and follow through with these simple instructions here. After following all of these, you should be able to find these files files, and when you can, we need to add this to our path. We'll start with export CUDA underscore home equals, then followed by this path here. User local CUDA hyphen whatever the version is, in my case 11.7. Boom. Now that we've set that, we need to export LD underscore library underscore path equals quotes, and it needs to end with quotes as well. Dollar sign LD library path colon followed by this second path over here. So I'll paste it in and hit enter. Now that we've done that, we should be able to run it once more. Dot slash web UI. And let's see if it's a little bit happier. L control click on the link once more, open it up in my browser. And now we can try again. Spaceman generate. There we go. You can see a spaceman is now generating. Heading back to my browser. There it is. Sweet. It's now working as we hope. Just a quick note the next time you boot up WSL, this may not be in your path still. This export library could home, etc. So I'd recommend writing it down so you don't need to necessarily remember what it is. It's a pretty good idea to sudo nano tilde slash dot bash rc to change what happens whenever we log into our user here. I'll scroll down to the very bottom and I'll add both of these commands like this, ending with quotes, save and close using control s and control x. There we go. I'll run it again. And now after a while of preparation, we can get to generating images. You only ever have to do this once. Simply just run that dot slash followed by webui.sh and we can get into the program. I'll also get to deleting these extra path files that don't work. ESRGAN and let's see. There we go. I'll delete all of these here. And to make things a bit simpler, I'll give you one command, cd that, and and dot slash webui.sh. By running this command, we'll automatically change to this directory whenever we start WSL, and it'll start this program by simply running that one command. Sweet. So we have these upscalers here. That's a handful of them. It'll start up a bit faster now because we don't have anything that doesn't work there. And I can control click into once more to open it up. Let's try Spaceman once more. Generate. And looking at the console, there it is generating and poof, there we have it. If we open it in a new tab, you can see it's 512 by 512. That's great. It also seems to be a little bit faster or a lot faster, but I think that's just because we have these sampling steps down. Let's go for realistic spaceman in a field of corn with a large fire portal behind comma. And let's add art by Greg Rutkowski. Generate. And after a few seconds, there we go. Let's open this in a new tab. That looks amazing. We can also click in it to get a bigger preview here. Now let's try something cool. Negative prompt. Let's say orange, or at least if I could spell orange, generate. Now it should try and avoid orange while generating the image, just like that. It has. Let's also avoid yellow. What happens now? Well, let's wait for it to generate. There we go. It's now picked different colors. This is a much, much cooler image, I will admit. There's a rocket, an exploding moon, a spaceman standing in a field. That's really cool, actually. So if we click on the image here, or look down below, we'll see steps taken, etc., and the seed, which is most important for recreating this. If I click save here, it'll save it. But where to? Have a look inside of the web UI folder here with a different command console. You'll see outputs, so we can see you into outputs. LS, here's our images. I can explorer.exe space dot. And if we get a Windows file explorer that we can go exploring around here. You can see my different images saved here. These are all the previous ones that I've generated, including the latest here. Sweet, it saves them all by default. If we CD back, LS and CD into the log folder, LS, you'll see images, LS images. You can see these images here. These are the saved images that we just clicked save on here. Let's change where these are going to. I'll head across to the settings tab and scrolling down here, you can see paths for saving. To start with output directory for images, I'll use the same place as yesterday's video, mount A for 
my physical A drive in Windows AI Web UI. Sounds like a good folder. I'll also copy the same for grids over here. I'll make it hyphen grids instead, and I'll also make this folder in Windows. I don't know if creating the folder in Windows is too important, but I'll make sure it exists here first. So new folder. Web UI grids. This won't actually do anything until we start generating new images. Instead, the save button saves to this folder here, log slash images. I'll change this to mount a AI web UI and maybe save for example. And once again, I'll create this folder. So new folder, web UI save. Cool. Let's call up trip. I'll save images to a subdirectory and grids as well. Apply text image save. Having a look here under web UI save, we have the image file here as well as a CSV file that contains information about how we made this. So there we go. There's the prompt up here and we're able to import this if we wish in the future. Let's go ahead and generate another image here. Generate. There's another image here. Looks pretty good. It hasn't saved anything to the save folder, but that's because it's gone to this folder here because we have subdirectories turned on. This is the prompt over here, though shortened in characters. And inside of it, we have these files here. They look great. We can change the batch size to make multiple images at once. Let's say a batch size of two. I'll make four images. Generate. It'll generate the first two. And they should appear. At least I think they would. I guess not. We'll have to wait for this to finish first. There we go. They've imported here. Oh, well, actually, never mind. A batch size of two. Generate four batches. This is generated two, four, six, eight, nine. Nine? I'm not entirely sure. Oh, the first image is a collage of all of them. Two times four is eight. Makes sense. Having a look at our folder here, because we've kept the same prompt, we have all of these images next to each other, and they all look pretty much exactly what I'd hoped for. This one's got a watermark at the bottom, which is great. Anyways. We've got the seeds here for this batch, etc. So we have scripts and things like that. Seeds, extras over here, but we can change variations, resizing the seed and the high res fix over here. This is a two-step process and allows us to create an image at a smaller resolution, upscale and improve details without changing composition. Let's generate two batches of two. But what we're really interested in is maybe taking one of these that we like and sending it to image to image, for example. Inside of here, we can image to image to change the style of it. I'll clear my prompt and negative prompt. I'll click interrogate here, which will then start downloading a rather large file, which should be able to interpret whatever image we have put in here and give us some tags about it. Just know that there's no visual feedback to clicking the button the first time. I clicked it a few times, but I hope that doesn't matter. Anyways, downloading this here, you'll see that when it's done, it'll download another file. This is a checkpoint model called Bullip which will allow us to pull words from images, essentially. I was looking for a tool like this the other day just to categorize certain art styles, and I'm really glad that it's included in this. This project is really thought about a lot. Text should pop up into the prompt here, but I'll delete it and click interrogate once more so you can see after a few seconds, the prompt fills up. This image is a man in a spacesuit standing in a field with a rocket in the background and a distant object in the distance. That's very specific by Christopher Balascas. Cool. Let's generate an image from this prompt here and see what it gives us. That's actually rather similar. It's a different art style to be sure, but it's similar nonetheless. It's got the general idea of what we were trying to do here. Sweet. We can inpaint, so I can drag an image in here and we can inpaint around something. So I'll take out maybe this astronaut here. I'm pretty sure we can change the size. There we go. I'll click the pen and make it a bit bigger. Let's paint out the entire astronaut. And for the inpainting, I'll give it the prompt of say, high school teacher, high school math teacher, generate, interrupt. And just like that, we have a high school math teacher, I suppose. I don't know. I think something weird happened here. Scrolling down, we have sampling steps, etc. What we're doing with this, restore faces, tiling batches, denoising, inpainted full resolution, maybe. Let's try that to see what that does. Maybe that'll make a difference. It should be twice as slow. Hey, there we go. There is a teacher. Look at that. That is actually pretty cool. Let's try an upside down high school math teacher generated. I think it's been confused. Maybe a Beatles as in like the band. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Anyways, you get the point. That's in painting. Batch image to image allows us to process images in a directory on the same machine where the server is running. So for example, mount a followed by whatever, and we can image to image a whole group of images from one style to another by putting in a directory here and an output directory. And I'm pretty sure we'll see a sample on the right hand side. Anyways, I won't be doing that here. Let's check out the extras tab at the top. We can import a single image or batch process images. I'll bring in this image from earlier here. We can resize to twice the size and pick an upscaler here. I heard about the Soledad on that wiki page, so I'll click one of them here. Actually, this is for manga. Let's run maybe Ultrasharp. We can put in a second upscaler, which is 
kind of crazy. GFP GAN visibility, code former. These are different upscalers as well. Let's just generate it as is and see what happens. If we have a look at our command prompt once more, you'll see some information about it. And there we go. That's a much bigger image here. Open a new tab. There's the original and there's the upscale. Definitely a huge difference there. Let's upscale to four times the size. Generate. After a few seconds, just like that, open image in new tab. Oh, well, I guess I'm allowed to here for some reason. This is four times bigger than it was before. Checking my output folder here, we have our generations in the web UI. Then we also have these here from upscaling. These ones without a name, I'm pretty sure are these upscales. Yes, they are. It would probably be better to put that in a different folder or simply save them out of here. I think I need to close this, scroll down. Is there a download? No, oh, there's not. Well, anyways, I have access to it via the files. So triple zero one, there it is at four times glory. Sweet. Obviously you wouldn't just chuck everything at it. All of these have their own purpose and reason for existing. So you should use them as you see fit and learn the tool like I will in the future. PNG info, if we drag an image into here, you'll be able to read the metadata saved on the actual image itself. If I right click properties, the image details, you can see in here, but there's not really anything in here, or at least not that you can see. All of this info, I'm 99% sure is actually saved alongside the image itself. Finally, the settings tab over here, this is worth a read through. You can choose different stable diffusion checkpoints. If you download 1.5 in the future, for example, we can apply color correction to image to image to match original colors, save a copy of images before applying color the correction. I think I'll have this turned on. Enable quantization, filter NSFW content, which is important if you're, say, streaming, as well as a ton of options here that you can get really into depth with. One of the things I will be changing is interrogate maximum description length. I'll crank this up to say 128 so it can really describe the hell out of an image. Maybe even max it out if you wish. User interface, there's nothing much I want to change there. Face restoration, yep, seems pretty good. I'll save and apply settings at the very top. And just like that, I can now bugger around as much as I want with this program to my heart's content. Anyways, this is a super, super in-depth tool, and this is really the power user version of what I showed you yesterday. If this is way too intimidating for you, then don't worry. In the description down below, you'll find a much simpler project that uses the same stable diffusion AI to generate images, though it shouldn't be anywhere near as confusing. Anyways, it's now been an hour or so of recording, so I'll definitely not look forward to editing this. Hopefully, it'll be much more concise and easy for you, as you shouldn't have any troubleshooting to deal with. Anyways. Thank you all for watching. My name's been Techno here for Troubleshoot, and I'll see you all next time. Ciao.